Um, well, welcome to everyone here. Uh, it was great to see some familiar faces. Um, welcome on behalf of the Zen Education Project to our session on abolitionists and reconstruction. Um, this is our last session in the spring series on the black freedom struggle. Um, we're gonna post a poll uh, to see how many of you have attended all the sessions um, and how many of you are here for the first time. Um, while you're responding to the poll, I'm going to just introduce myself. Uh, I am a high school teacher in Philadelphia and an editor of uh, Rethinking Schools. Uh, we, uh, Rethinking Schools coordinates the Zen Education Project along with Teaching for Change. Um, I helped to launch the Teach Reconstruction campaign for the Zen Education Project and edited the book uh, Teaching a People's History of Abolition in the Civil War, uh, which I should mention uh, Manisha has a, a short uh, student-friendly piece in, uh, on abolitionists in the Civil War. Um, the Zen Education Project is hosting this session today and offers free downloadable people's history lessons um, that many of you have used uh, for middle school and high school classrooms um, from the Zen Education Project website. Uh, we have a campaign to teach about Reconstruction that people should look at. Um, there are several lessons and resources um, on the website for that campaign. All right, so let's, let's take a look at this poll. Looks like, wow, so we've got 70% uh, uh, of people have been to multiple sessions. That's excellent. Um, about 20% of people are here um, for the first time um, and about 10% who've been to one session. Okay. Um, that's great that so many people have co come to uh, so many of these. Um, so uh, we thank everyone uh, who's joining us today for uh, the last session in the spring series on the Black Freedom Struggle. Um, and we're looking uh, for funding. Uh, we've got some leads to continue this series uh, in the fall. Um, and we definitely hope to do that. Um, so throughout the session, we want you to use the chat box, uh, post questions, comments, resources, ideas, uh, our guest speaker will read your questions uh, and try to respond after the breakout groups. Um, we'll do a short evaluation at the end as well. Um, so we're now gonna start our conversation. Um, and after about 20 minutes, we'll pause uh, so that uh, you all can meet each other and talk and reflect on the conversation in small groups to share insights. Um, so I'm really happy uh, to be here facilitating this conversation and introdu going to introduce Manisha Sinha. Um, she is the James L. and Shirley A. Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut. Uh, and she is the author of uh, multiple books and editor of multiple books, in including uh, The Slave's Cause, A History of Abolition, uh, which is such a, a crucial history of the abolitionist movement. Um, so I'm just gonna kick it off with, uh, go, jump right into it um, with a question for Manisha. Um, all right, so um, although this session is focused on, on reconstruction, um, and I'm very interested to hear, uh, Manisha, your thoughts on reconstruction because that's really where your book um, leaves off. Um, I do wanna start the discussion though by talking about the pre-Civil War abolition movement um, we're living through one of the greatest rebellions in the long black freedom struggle. Uh, and I think a lot of activists and thinkers um, who are thinking about the system today of mass incarceration and the police as the frontline enforcers of that system, um, they're looking all the way back um, to the abolitionists. Um, in many ways, this was you know, one of the first great social movements uh, of this country, of the world. Um, yet, yet most of my students, um, both in Philly and New York and Portland, Oregon, where I taught before, um, you know, although they may have heard of one or two abolitionists, um, don't understand this as a movement that led to the freedom of enslaved people. I think um, the typical narrative that my students come in with uh, in the classroom is, yeah, there were some great people, Harriet Tubman, for example, who saved a few people, um, but ultimately it was Abraham Lincoln um, who freed the enslaved uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, so I'm hoping if we could start, could you start by talking about the role um, that abolitionists played in ending slavery 
Um, and what are some of the lessons you think we could learn to, uh, today from that social movement? Yeah, so that's a great question, Adam, because um, I, I, I have noticed, of course, that uh, most people today are not aware of the fact that we had an interracial radical social movement like abolition uh, in the 19th century and even earlier in the 18th, uh, and one that was actually uh, quite successful uh, in its short-term goals. Um, and even today, you're right, when activists think about uh, contemporary um, you know, uh, problems and contemporary oppressions, um, whether it's mass incarceration or the fight against systemic racial inequality and police brutality, um, they look back at the abolitionists and they use the term abolition. You will notice that the term abolition is resonant with American activists and radicals. Uh, and there's a reason why that is so. Um, of course, the great Howard Zinn himself, when he wrote about SNCC, uh, looked back at the abolitionist movement and many civil rights activists uh, saw themselves as, quote, the new abolitionists. They demanded a second reconstruction of American democracy and maybe, you know, right now we are ready for a third reconstruction of American democracy, uh, given the movement for black lives and the upsurge in protests that we have seen uh, this year. Now, um, in terms of understanding the movement, uh, I think historically uh, in mainstream, um, sort of the mainstream academy, uh, abolitionists had been neglected. Uh, and while you had this sort of lost cause mythology of the civil war that somehow Southerners had fought for states' rights and their own honor and not for slavery, uh, you simply had very sort of caricatured uh, pictures of the abolition movement. So you would have abolitionists being portrayed as uh, these radical fanatics uh, who were inconsequential, who had no influence uh, on politics. Uh, that changed a little bit during the civil rights era when historians like Zinn and others started looking back at history and started looking for precursors uh, to the civil rights movement. Um, but when I started writing my book, which was, oh my God, uh, over 10 years ago, um, it, it, even in the mainstream academy, I think people did not really appreciate uh, the radical nature and the significance of the abolition movement. Um, you know, many times they were seen as sort of racially paternalistic or economically conservative. And while there were books on African Americans and women in the movement, there was no attempt to look at the ways in which these groups had maybe led and defined the movement. So what I tried to do in my book uh, and what I try to tell people when they teach abolition is, is not to teach it as simply the stories of individuals, even though you're right, they're outstanding individuals that we now all know of, right? Uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, there are so many uh, like them. So we need to think of them exactly in the way that you put it, which is as a social movement, as a radical social movement that had certain tactics, ideologies, uh, certain differences within the movement over those tactics and ideologies, but really one that eventually shaped the course of American democracy. Thanks so much. Um, just a follow up on that. One of, one of the uh, things that I think really struck me reading your book is how you've kind of unearthed and re-emphasized the critical role that, that Black abolitionists played in pushing um, white abolitionists to take more radical stances, to move to more confrontational tactics and um, things like that. Could you, could you talk about that a bit? Yes. So, um, you know, before I wrote this book, of course, there were many books that had been written on African-American abolitionists. The great Benjamin Qualls had written the sort of first monograph, uh, complete monograph on Black abolitionists. And his whole purpose was just to prove that they were part of the movement because they had been so neglected by mainstream historians. Uh, so I definitely wanted to highlight the role of African-Americans as being in, in the vanguard of the movement, uh, as not just people who participated in the movement, uh, but people who actually thought of many of its ideas and tactics uh, and who radicalized the movement. Uh, for instance, the abolition movement, especially of the 19th century, you know, the period just before the Civil War, um, 
in that movement, when African Americans are taking on leadership roles, they're lecturing agents, they're very much part of that movement, um, they make sure that the movement is not just to end slavery, but that it is also a movement for Black equality and for Black citizenship, equal citizenship in this country. So they attack Southern slavery, but they also attack discrimination and segregation in the North. Uh, so it's really important to uncover the significance of African Americans in the movement in that respect, because they're really laying the groundwork for reconstruction. You know, when abolitionist jurisprudence, when they're using the Bill of Rights to fight for, for Black people's rights, or arguing that we should have a national standard for citizenship, they're laying the groundwork for that brief moment during Reconstruction when you have an interracial democracy. And that all comes from Black activists. Uh, and white abolitionists like Garrison are quick to adopt that program. They're quick to adopt the program of uh, citizenship. They reject this program of colonization, of, of sending free Black people back to Africa. Instead, they argue that the fight for Black rights has to be in this country. So I did uh, do that. But the part that I think was somewhat unique to my book was to look at not just free African-Americans, but also enslaved African-Americans. After all, 90% of the Black population was enslaved before the Civil War. So it was really important for me to highlight the role of slave resistance in the abolition movement. Uh, and if you look at the leadership of the abolition movement in the 1840s and 50s, it is composed of these outstanding fugitive slaves, right? All these runaway, like Douglas, Harriet Tubman, William Wells Brown, James W.C. Pennington. I mean, there's so many of them, I could just keep going on. Um, they really assume a dominant role in the abolition movement. So I really wanted to look at the ways in which slave resistance broadly understood not just as instances of slave rebellions, even though I cover that, but also the ways in which uh, enslaved people themselves fed into the movement and radicalized it by introducing um, tactics, uh, opposition, let's say, to the fugitive slave law on the streets uh, that were far more militant uh, than in previous years. And, and I want to add, this was one of my follow-up questions, but it's also I see a question in the chat. Could you talk specifically about the role of Black women abolitionists and, and the role they played in the movement? Absolutely. You know, um, African-American women really take a leading role in the abolition movement. One of the first female anti-slavery societies formed um, was formed in Salem, uh, and it was an all-Black society. Uh, it is only later on that they start admitting white women. So it becomes an interracial society. Uh, and when the abolition movement starts in the early 1830s, Garrison points out uh, to white women and says, you know, look at all these black women. They're forming these anti-slavery societies. You should imitate them and do the same or join their societies. So black women play a very important part um, in this uh, movement. Uh, and we also know, of course, that Black women uh, play an important part of the movement. We also know that one of the first women um, to speak publicly to public audiences, one of the first American women to do so, was a Black woman, right? Uh, Maria Stewart. We know that one of the first American women, not just one of the first Black women, but one of the first American women to be ever published was a Black woman, Phyllis Wheatley with her book of poems uh, that was published in England uh, in 1773. I mean, this is when most white women did not publish uh, uh, anything. And if you look at Wheatley's poems, um, many of them, I argue at least, uh, had anti-slavery content. For a long time, they were dismissed as uh, being too sort of deferential or too much in the, the, the language and the tropes uh, that was adopted in mainstream Western literature at that time. But actually, if you read Wheatley closely, uh, and not just her published work, but even her letters, uh, one of them was so famous that it actually got published in New England newspapers. Um, if you read all her corpus, you see that she was really, in a way, uh, the mother of the movement, of the abolition movement. Uh, so interestingly enough, Garrison in the 1830s republishes 
her book of poetry because he thinks they are so significant. Uh, so black women play a leading role. They play a pioneering role uh, in the abolition movement. Uh, and later on, of course, you have outstanding uh, abolitionist feminists um, like Tubman, who was not just active in the Underground Railroad, but was also a suffragist, uh, but Sojourner Truth and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, uh, whose speeches um, were the sensation of the abolitionist circuit. Um, Harper was so good that she was employed as the main lecturing agent of the main anti-slavery society. And trust me, there were not a lot of black people in Maine then. Uh, and uh, many times she was going to towns uh, where she was the only black person uh, around. Uh, so I think it's important, in fact, to recover the relatively forgotten role of many of these black abolitionist feminists, because we often think of a suffrage. Uh, we often think of feminism as a white woman's project. Uh, and it's not true if you look at many of these, <clears throat> excuse me, outstanding uh, black abolitionist feminists. Mm. So fascinating. So, so just one more question before we transition into Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, you know, I, I've looked a lot at, at a lot of different textbooks and what they say about the abolitionist movement. And many still parrot kind of what you had said earlier that the scholarship did, that the abolitionists were this small band of radicals that, you know, didn't really have that much political influence. Um, and they highlight, you know, f you know a few yeah, fanatics, as they call, you know, might call them, but it's it's really the 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 key thing is that they still portray them as a very small movement. Um, and I was always struck because I that was a lot a picture of I had of the abolitionist movement um, when I learned that the American Anti Slavery Society had over thirteen hundred local chapters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in what was a much smaller United States at that point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just think today, you know, if you had. 1300 Black Lives Matter chapters in this country meeting on a regular basis. Um, I'm, not, I'm not even sure that we have that right now. You know, so I, I just, if you could talk about the size um, and scope of the movement, especially leading into the Civil War. Yeah. Um, that's, that's another very good question because you're right. Uh, that's the way textbooks generally tend to deal with the abolition movement. Um, you know, it's a tendency not to give importance perhaps uh, to people who probably uh, were more influential in shaping the course of uh, American democracy in the 19th century than many prominent senators and presidents even, who some of them are highly forgettable, the ones in the 19th uh, century. Um, so uh, that is why I used the perspective of a social movement. Um, I thought it was important, in fact, uh, to look at the way in which the movement came about, how it organized itself. Uh, so if you look at abolition, you know, they're kind of old fashioned moralizers sometimes, you know, they can like Douglas quote chapter and verse from the Bible, uh, et cetera, to fight against uh, slavery or invoke the golden rule to fight against racism. Um, but they were very modern in certain respects. Uh, they had an amazing print culture. Uh, they had uh, many pamphlets and newspapers um, they had organizations, as you mentioned, over a thousand. In fact, we have an undercount because I, as I was researching my book, I would find tiny little anti-slavery societies in some forgotten New England town who sometimes didn't even show up in the records, right? Uh, so they, they did really spread out in the North into rural hamlets everywhere. In fact, the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020 um, you know, I noticed in my small town in New England, there was a protest and it made me think of the abolition movement because that's how much it had spread even into smaller towns, into rural areas in the north. Um, and in terms of numbers, you know, it, just in terms of due paying numbers, uh, James Burney, the secretary of the American Anti-Slavery Society, just guessed at around 250,000. But that was just a guess. Then if you look at the numbers that had signed petitions, you get hundreds and hundreds of thousands more. Then if you look at, uh, you know, people who just uh, participated in one campaign or the other, you get many more fellow travelers. So abolition actually was far more widespread, I think, than we have understood it until now. Um, it's difficult to get the exact numbers 
uh, I tried to make those uh, numbers sort of clear in my book when I talked about the anatomy of the movement. Um, we know, of course, um, that abolitionists were also politically significant uh, because they first started their own political party, the Liberty Party, which sort of made anti-slavery uh, a factor in national politics. Uh, and that was the precursor to the Free Soil Party of 1848 and eventually the anti-slavery Republican Party uh, in the 1850s when you have, of course, the rise of Lincoln. That's the last time the third party has been successful in the history of the United States. Uh, they go from being founded in 1854 to winning a presidential election in 1860. That doesn't just happen. Abolitionist activists had plowed that ground for decades since the 1830s. Uh, so when the Republican victory comes about, it is important, in fact, to understand that abolitionists had played a crucial role in preparing the Northern public or the majority of those Northern white men who voted for the Republican Party, which led to secession and civil war. And as far as Lincoln is concerned, you know, in the Emancipation Proclamation, he's quite clear. He actually says, he says, you know, uh, the abolitionists thought of all this before me they should get the credit. He actually says that, and I was able to get that quote. Now he quotes, uh, you know, he mentions rather Wilberforce and Garrison, right? The white abolitionists. He doesn't mention the black abolitionists, but where does Garrison get many of his ideas from? From black abolitionists. Uh, so um, I think it is important in fact for our school textbooks and the ways in which we teach the histories of slavery and abolition to emphasize the history of the movement because the tendency is to think of emancipation as a gift handed down to black people when it was not that. It was not that before the war and certainly not during the war when enslaved people did pretty much what they had been doing before the war, which is to speak, seek out free spaces and allies in their fight against slavery. And could you talk a little bit, this is kind of just where you left off, about the role that abolitionists played during the Civil War, and, and in particular in conversation with, with Lincoln, who, you know, all moves, you know, sig significantly, I think, during the, the Civil War in terms of the way he thinks the, the war aim, what the war aims are, and, um, and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and what role does the aboli do the abolitionists play in that? Yeah, so I uh, ended up writing a number of essays on, on this issue because of um, uh, the, the Lincoln Bicentennial and President Obama was elected and he used the Lincoln Bible. Uh, and there was so much going on with, uh, you know, trying to, to, to think about Lincoln's legacy. And I look very closely at Lincoln's relationship with the abolitionists because the debate over emancipation uh, amongst historians had really been, you know, who freed the slaves? Uh, was it Lincoln? Uh, or was it the enslaved themselves who saw Lincoln and the Union Army and the federal government as, the lib as their liberators before they saw themselves in that role? You know, by simply fleeing to Union Army lines and forcing the army uh, because of logistical reasons and the government because of political reasons to deal with the issue of emancipation. So that was the debate. And I, I argued uh, in many articles that I wrote on this issue, which eventually I incorporated some of it into my book, was that, you know, really we need to understand emancipation as a process. And one of those forgotten historical actors in the history of emancipation were the abolitionists. So if you look at what abolitionists do immediately after Lincoln is elected, you know, they start pressuring him and the Republican Party, and they're pressuring them from within because the radicals in the Republican Party, like Charles Sumner, Thaddeus Stevens, are completely aligned with the abolitionist movement. The abolitionists themselves, uh, they've been involved in the battles against slavery before the war, uh, and they're able, you see, abolitionists gain a kind of an insider's edge when the Republican Party is elected. That's not normally understood that way. But if you were to draw a Venn diagram of the Republican Party and the abolitionist movement, you know, the, uh, the radicals uh, would be the, the people in the middle, the radical, they're not literally in the middle, but they're the left of the Republican Party, but, but they would be that overlap of those two circles uh, would be radical Republicans. And um, 
they really do bring the abolitionist agenda in Congress. Uh, they move before Lincoln with the confiscation acts uh, and making sure that the Union Army does not return fugitive slaves uh, back to, to rebel slaveholders. Uh, and so, yes, they play an important part even in terms of persuasion, which is what they've been doing all the time before the war. Um, you know, when Lincoln starts flirting again with colonization schemes, uh, they rebuke him. Uh, one of the best rebukes uh, of Lincoln, actually, was written by a black woman, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She writes an essay saying, you know, that this is the most ridiculous plan in the middle of a war uh, when you actually need black people to be fighting against slavery to think about, you know, expatriating them back to, to uh, Africa or any other place in Central America that he was experimenting with. It was, it was the wrong thing. So, so both black and white abolitionists I think play an extremely important part, uh, actually, in, in pushing for emancipation and pushing that uh, process forward. Mm, so important. Um, all right, let's let's move to Reconstruction. Um, can you walk us through um, what happens to the abolitionist movement after the war? Because I think this is something that's often completely left out of the textbooks um, and mainstream accounts, um, as if, you know, kind of all the abolitionists say, you know, we won, they go home. Uh, you know, do, do they move on to fight for other causes? Does the movement splinter? Do different sections of the movement define freedom differently? What happens after the war? Yeah, so during the war itself, you know, uh, abolitionists, were forming, you know, Freedmen's Aid Societies, they were forming, um, you know, Emancipation Leagues and all these other societies to address the problem of what's going to happen after the war. How do we define freedom? African Americans themselves had a good idea about how they define freedom, right? There's that famous uh, conversation uh, between black leaders in Savannah, Georgia with General Sherman, where they tell him clearly that for us, freedom means you know, economic independence. It means uh, equal political rights. They have a good idea about that and they have good allies with abolitionists who start founding the first schools. These are the roots of many of the HBUCs going back to these Freedmen schools being founded uh, by abolitionists uh, during the Civil War. Uh, they, these Freedmen's Aid Societies are an important precedent for the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, during the during Reconstruction, which is a federal government agency, which was supposed to oversee the transition from slavery to freedom. Uh, so abolitionists are already anticipating the problems of Reconstruction. Now, the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1865, uh, Garrison says, you know, look, I'm done because I think the momentum for change has moved to the government. We as movement activists, you know, it's not that he says, I don't support black citizenship. And now that we have emancipation, my work is done. Because he always believed in fighting for equal rights for blacks as well. A lot of people misunderstand that. But he says, you know, the American Anti-Slavery Society as an agitational tool is pretty much done. Now we should be looking at practical things like Freedmen's Aid Societies, working with the government, uh, et cetera. And, and Phillips and, and Douglas tell him no. They said, unless we get uh, an amendment to the constitution that actually guarantees black citizenship rights, we are not going to dissolve the society. And, and Garrison loses. Phillips and Douglas actually win and the society continues. Now, eventually in 1870, when the 15th amendment to the constitution giving black men the right to vote is passed, Phillips and Douglas say, we are done. Now we are gonna disband the American anti-slavery society. And there are other radicals who say no, our work is not done because land has not been redistributed as yet to black people. The promise of reconstruction has not been fulfilled. So these debates continue within the abolition movement. Now, uh, Phillips and Douglas win the debate. They could have ill imagined that reconstruction would be completely overthrown, that all those constitutional amendments would be completely overthrown in the South uh, through a regime of racial terror. Uh, and also legal conservatism with the U United States Supreme Court, um, you know, pretty much overthrowing uh, and narrowly interpreting these amendments and laws so that it was easy for Southern states to, to skirt them and to establish a regime of Jim Crow, et cetera, and all the 
the results, the victories of the abolition movement are frittered away. Um, I read some abolitionist memoirs uh, after, including Douglas's last autobiography, uh, after Reconstruction is overthrown. And, and they're like, you know, the fight never ends. Uh, we fought all this. We thought we had reached the promised land, and now we are back here. Uh, and it all feeds into new protest movements uh, into the, at the turn of the century and early 20th century, many descendants of abolitionists, uh, including Black activists who really identified with and admired uh, abolitionists and admired the radical Republicans who had instituted Reconstruction like Du Bois, uh, end up founding the NAACP uh, to renew the fight uh, for Black rights. So in a way, the abolitionist legacy uh, encompasses Reconstruction, but it goes beyond that. Uh, the idea, as I say in my book, you know, the slave's cause never dies. Uh, the reason why I say that is because it seems that that contestation for Black rights is a never ending project in this country. Um, one, of the, one of the other things I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I think so often the textbooks bit, kind of jump from the Civil War to these debates within Congress and the president and then the backlash um, against Reconstruction um, and, and skip over this kind of tremendous moment of interracial democracy, as you said mm -hmm. earlier, um, in particular with regards to social movements at the time before the 15th Amendment, but, but after the war, it seems like there's this moment um, for a, a few years where different social movements are both inspired by each other, they're feeding off each other, they're to some extent collaborating, right? In particular, the labor movement, the women's movement, um, and the abolitionist movement. Um, the American Equal Rights Association is founded, you know, bringing together abolitionists and women's rights activists. Um, the National Labor Union is discussing opening its doors to black and female workers and activists. Um, could you talk a bit about this moment? Because I think it, it too often gets skipped over. And, and what, what can we learn from it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, I think Reconstruction was a moment of great possibility in this country. Uh, and as many times in American history, when we've had dramatic progress in Black rights, it feeds off other movements arise. You know, the same thing happens in the Civil Rights Movement you know, with uh, the rise of second wave feminism, uh, Native American rights, NAM, uh, you know, many other movements that kind of feed off this fight for black equality. And I think Du Bois said it best. Uh, and that was the fight for black equality was not just something that would benefit African Americans themselves, but that it would redefine American democracy as a whole because it inspired uh, you know, radical imaginations. It inspired all these other movements. And you're right, during Reconstruction, um, there's a lot of experimentation with wanting to do more than just have political and civil rights. You know, people are thinking of land redistribution, uh, feminists are fighting for women's right to vote. It seemed like a moment of endless possibilities precisely because uh, there was this moment of interracialism. And after the fall of Reconstruction, you still have the rise of other movements. You still have a suffrage movement. You have a labor movement. You have a temperance movement. You have, um, you know, the Grangers and the populist movement, the Farmers' Revolt. Uh, and some of them do make overtures to African Americans, like the populist movements and the Knights of Labor uh, in the beginning. And then later on, of course, uh, when you have other labor uh, unions coming up, like uh, um, the international workers of the world, the IWW, so they do make overtures to African Americans and there are certain fights uh, and uh, labor uh, fights throughout the country uh, which are interracial uh, and sometimes successful. Uh, but what's missing in many of these movements after the fall of Reconstruction is a clear commitment to black equality. Uh, you see that in the suffrage movement, you see that in uh, the labor movement, you see that in the populist movement later on, uh, you know, black people get forgotten. Uh, and that becomes the Achilles heels of not just American democracy, but even of progressive movements. Uh, because many times 
uh, for instance, the suffrage movement, which I'm looking at right now, um, in order to appease Southern white women, uh, they decide, okay, we can have segregated locals. We don't have to talk too much about uh, lynching or the racial terror in the, in the South that you know, black uh, suffragists like Ida B. Wells is talking about. So it is really important for us to learn the lesson that uh, for the, especially for movements on the left, grassroots radical movements on the left, uh, that uh, the, the fight for black equality is really central to any sort of reimagining of American democracy. We see that even today. Mm. So just want to briefly mention a few lessons. We actually have a lot of lessons at Zen Education Project on um, abolition, the Civil War, and Reconstruction. So I can't mention all of them, but I do um, want to mention just a few that are out there. Um, this one on your screen is uh, Who Fought to End Slavery? Meet the Abolitionists. It's a great mixer um, role play where, where kids um, Get, uh, get to take on the role of one abolitionist and then they meet the other abolitionists in the room. Um, and, it, and we specifically um, wrote it to try and highlight abolitionists who are often not highlighted um, in the curriculum, um, as well as complicate some of the stories uh, that, that, we, that kids have heard about um, the more prominent abolitionists. Um, another uh, really important lesson we have is, uh, if, if there is no struggle, teaching a people's history of the abolition movement. This one uh, has students uh, write uh, an, uh, an autobiography of an abolitionist. They step into the role much more deeper. Um, and then they go through a series of debates um, and they, they lead that discussion. It's a student-led discussion um, it, that the abolitionist movement actually went through um, in the lead up to the Civil War. Uh, if you haven't done it in your classroom, I just can't recommend it enough. Uh, poetry of Defiance um, is another lesson um, that highlights the resistance of enslaved people themselves. Um, and there's some really good um, ideas in that lesson for how to tie that um, to the abolitionist movement in the way um, that, that Manisha does in her book. Um, lots of great teacher testimonials about that as well. Um, and, uh, and then again, please also go to the Teach Reconstruction campaign page um, where there's uh, several um, lessons on uh, reconstruction, um, including um, another mixer lesson called uh, When the Impossible Was Made Possible that, that kind of gets at um, some of the connections between the different social movements that begin to be made um, in the first couple years during reconstruction. Um, so uh, we're going to uh, continue a little uh, our discussion. Um, I'm just going to say today's session is going to go until um, 3.15. Uh, but if you have to leave early, please fill out the evaluation. And there's going to be a link in the chat box um, posted periodically. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so we're going to stop at around 3.10 um, and to, to give a shout outs and thank yous. Um, but we want to just continue the conversation a bit with some of the questions that people threw in the chat. Um, and I wanted to start with, um, there was a question about David Walker um, and the, the role he played and his, his appeal, David Walker's appeal, um, and, and where does he stand? I think the question was in the pantheon of abolitionist heroes. Um, so, so what can we say about David Walker? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question um, because David Walker was so important because of his appeal to the colored citizens of the world. It's really the first radical abolitionist pamphlet uh, that is published in 1829. Uh, and, you know, the first black abolitionist newspaper has been founded in 1827, Freedom's Journal. So Walker is part of this rising sort of militant black abolitionism of the 1820s. It also coincides with many famous large slave conspiracies um, like Denmark Vesey's slave conspiracy in uh, South Carolina. Walker was actually a free black man from North Carolina and was uh, probably in Charleston when Vesey's conspiracy took place. So you can see how slave resistance and free black radicalism really are intertwined and flow together. 
By the time he comes to Boston and he writes this pamphlet, he's part of the Massachusetts General Colored Association, one of the first abolitionist groups ever founded. Uh, and his appeal causes a national stir, you know, uh, because it's distributed all over the country by black sailors, even to the South. Uh, and uh, it uh, makes many Southern governors very nervous because they think he, his pamphlet would lead to a slave rebellion. Uh, Garrison, when he starts publishing The Liberator, actually his, the first few issues are just devoted to David Walker's appeal. He praises David Walker's appeal and by the end of 1831, you have Nat Turner's rebellion and Garrison is one of two editors uh, in the United States who actually praises Nat Turner, even though he is a pacifist. Um, and so uh, black radicalism of which David Walker was an essential part really flowed into the growth of the abolition movement, the second wave of the abolition movement. Uh, it was a radical uncompromising movement by that time. Uh, and um, you could certainly say uh, that many of the white abolitionists like Garrison got their ideas uh, from African Americans uh, like Walker. Walker also inspired, by the way, Maria Stewart, uh, the black woman who I, abolitionist woman whom I spoke about. Um, she was mentored by Walker. Uh, unfortunately, he died early, uh, but this interracialism uh, that I talk about uh, in my book, um, there's a chapter on interracial immediatism that traces out all these connections. Uh, Walker's widow names her son Edwin Garrison Walker. So she names him after Garrison because she sees Garrison as keeping his memory alive. Uh, and he, David Walker's son, uh, becomes one of the first black elected politicians in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So he's important. I think the full story needs to be told. I mean, I, one of the reasons I think the book is big is because uh, even though people have heard of these figures, and they know about this one thing that they've written, they don't know that much about them or their legacies. And I think it's important to remember them. And Walker is certainly one of them. Absolutely. Um, uh, before we jump into the next question, I just wanna share the results of the poll um, so people can see them. Uh, I can see how many people have learned about this history, less, less than half, I think, in most of these categories. Um, so I, I hope this session has propelled people to teach more, to learn about it. Um, okay, so let's, uh, there were a couple of questions about kind of some of the tensions within the abolitionist movement. Um, so there was one about uh, many abolitionists were anti-slavery and anti-black. Um, mm -hmm. And a uh, question about teaching that, you know, I'll be honest, I don't know that I do uh, a deep enough dive into that question. Uh, I'm curious what you what you say about that, Manisha, and then also uh, class differences, right? Um, why do some people have more equality than others? And there's this. Um, so if you could talk about those two things, both kind of racism within the abolitionist movement and um, how class differences play out. Yes, absolutely. So it's really important, I think, for us to distinguish the abolition movement as a radical social movement in which African Americans played a central role with anti-slavery, political anti-slavery, right? So when the abolitionist movement founded its party, the Liberty Party, it was an abolitionist party, but it had to take on other causes in order to be successful as a political party. Eventually that became the Free Soil Party and its platform was not even abolition. Its platform was just the non-extension of slavery into Western territories. So many Northerners joined the Free Soil Party and the Republican Party um, who were not particularly liberal when it came to views about black equality and race. So the radicals within the Republican Party who were the abolitionists were constantly fighting with the conservatives and the moderates, uh, pushing them to take more abolitionist positions. So first we must distinguish, as I said, between radical abolitionism and political anti-slavery. Many times we don't. And sometimes people were anti-slavery at the, you know, what I call the lowest common denominator of anti-slavery, which was, let's just stop the expansion of slavery to the West. But, you know, we don't really want to deal with even ending slavery, abolition or black rights. That's like going too far. 
It's really the civil war, the revolutionary situation of the civil war that pushes the North towards abolition and then eventually towards black rights during reconstruction. Now within the abolition movement, there were times of racial paternalism, right? Uh, by white abolitionists towards black abolitionists. I w really sort of pushed back against the literature, especially uh, there were these historians, Jane and William Pease, who wrote a book on black abolitionists and said, well, you know, black abolitionists were really not effective at all because the abolition movement was so racist that they were in the sidelines. They had no influence in the movement. That was simply wrong. So I, I really pushed back against this narrative that, you know, white abolitionists, in fact, white abolitionists were amazingly radical compared to the average white American in the North, forget the South at that point as a slave society, but in the North. Uh, in the 19th century. But there still were it, times of racial paternalism. And I'll give you one example. But it was not as if black abolitionists just folded up and accepted it. They pushed back against any instance when you had what I would see as creative conflict. This is the one space of interracialism in antebellum America, which was a highly segregated society racially. But here, blacks and whites and men and women came together to debate issues and to talk about it. They were called promiscuous societies precisely for that reason, right? Um, the incident that I'm talking about was Theodore Parker, who was a Unitarian abolitionist, you know, supported John Brown, was involved in fugitive slave rescues, gives a speech and he, and he uses something that's really popular in Anglo-American culture at that time, which is the cult of Anglo-Saxonism. And it pervades Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin too, where he says, oh, you know, um, I, Anglo-Saxons are really brave and we are always fighting and we would never be enslaved. The African race is more docile because they've been enslaved for so long. And he's saying this in an anti-slavery movement. Immediately, John S. Rock, a black abolitionist, jumps up and says, this is racism. This has no place in an anti-slavery platform the cult of Anglo-Saxonism, which is, as I said, really popular, developed by the British writer Thomas Carlyle in the 1850s. Uh, and he says, you know, you really should not be talking about this, uh, in, in, in this and this is racism. And what's interesting is that the conversation doesn't stop there. Parker gets up and apologizes and said, you know, you're right. I misspoke. And for me, that's what, uh, how, um, instances of racial paternalism were dealt with. And I have many other such instances in my book uh, where I argue that this notion that somehow white abolitionists were irredeemably racist and therefore black abolitionists were just sidelined and had no effect in the movement. It's just a historical, in fact, the evidence, uh, it tells us more about uh, the way we view the world, I think, than the evidence. And as a historian, I think, it's so important to go back and read those sources, but that's exactly what I learned in graduate school while I was studying the abolition movement. Uh, and so I felt when I was writing the book, I had to really go back to the archives, actually read. And, and for me, the best judge were, what are African-Americans saying? What is the black abolitionist saying about this particular white person? And, and I found many instances in which historians had actually distorted um, many encounters, including the famous Douglas Garrison break in the 1850s over politics and abolition. I deal with that extensively in the book. I, I see we don't have too much time, so, so I won't get into it right now, but it's in my book and I talk in depth about how that break occurs and why it occurs and why we should look at it beyond simple racial terms. Um, right. That was a definite ideological break between the two. Um, it, you know, the, I see a question in the chat about the, that PBS abolitionist documentary, and, and I think it's really related to this, this question, because, you know, I, I, what really struck me when I watched it is that I think it, there's four abolitionists that they feature um, throughout the documentary, and I think all, four or five, and I think yeah. all of them are white except Douglas. Um, I'm just curious what you, you know, what, what you thought about that documentary. What do they do well? What did they get wrong? What... 
So I was one of the advisors and the talking heads in that documentary. And I really didn't want them to have just four or five people because I had this vision of the abolitionist movement as a movement, right? And I wanted them to portray the movement rather than just fixate on four or five individuals. Uh, but the writer for the documentary said that that's the only way they, they could convey the story. They had only three episodes and they would do it. So then he told me who were the, you know, the people he had chosen. Angelina Grimke, Garrison, John Brown, uh, Douglas, and then Harriet Beecher Stowe. That really bugged me. I really fought with him about that. I said, you know, Harriet Beecher Stowe was not an abolitionist. She was in fact a colonizationist, right? Uncle Tom's cabin ends with uh, George wanting to go off to Liberia. Her family was a family of colonizationists and they had opposed abolition, right? Um, so I said, you know, you can't have Harriet Beecher Stowe, you have to have a black woman. I mean, Harriet Tubman, another Harriet, you know, don't have Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, but I lost that battle because they would not, they would not, you know, agree uh, to removing Harriet Beecher Stowe because they thought Uncle Tom's Cabin had such a, a tremendous impact, which it did. But, you know, she was not an abolitionist. She became an abolitionist after publishing Uncle Tom's Cabin. And that's the part of the story they didn't tell, right? Uh, because Mon Delaney says, you know, I don't like Uncle Tom. He's just too groveling for me, you know? It doesn't represent us well. And she takes his criticism to heart. So then she publishes her second book, which no one's heard of, uh, called Dread, uh, The Tale of the Dreadful Swamp, which is a story of slave rebellion. And the, the, free, the person Dread is very different to the image of the, you know, the saintly Christian suffering Uncle Tom. But you can see why Uncle Tom's Cabin is the more popular book, because it really appealed to white uh, prejudices and white sentiments about uh, race and slave. And, and that's why it was in a way so effective, and it becomes this international bestseller. Um, so yeah, I lost the battle both in terms of getting a longer series about the movement and also by having at least one black woman in it. Now there was a lot of criticism of the documentary because of this, because of these choices uh, that uh, the writer insisted on making. Uh, and uh, I still felt that it still does more than what we had until then, which was like nothing on the abolitionists. And I still think one could use it in the classroom with a proper critique of it. I still use it in all the teacher institutes that I do over summer uh, with the teachers when I look at slavery and abolition and film. And I talk about how we can use it, but you know, with those criticisms and putting it in that context in mind. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll say also jump in here that uh, I, I use in particular, I think the, the I think it's the third part um, mm -hmm. where the Civil War begins, um, where they actually do kind of take a step back from these individual stories and talk more about the interplay between the movement and Lincoln. Um, I think that part in particular, I think is useful in, in the uh, in a high in high school classroom and has worked well with uh, my students, but even even so, as as you said, you have to also go in with a certain amount of critique because they do kind of make Garrison into this kind of new kind of white savior in a sense. Um, yeah. I mean, I think but, it's really important to understand that um, you need to be able to read Garrison, um, you know, read get what Garrison is saying. You know, Garrison is not saying I'm here to slave black, save black people. You know, he constantly says, oh, and I got this idea from African-Americans, you know, and in his early, uh, if you look at the early issue of the Liberator, it, it is completely suffused with African-American ideas. Uh, so when Garrison goes, to, and of course, African-Americans are majority of the subscribers, it's really a black newspaper, you know, 450 out of the... 500 are African Americans. So when he goes to Britain uh, and he's introduced to Lord Buxton, who's an anti slavery politician, Lord Buxton looks at him, he says, You're William Lloyd Garrison? I thought you were black. And Garrison says, Well, I'll take that as the highest compliment of my work. Um, you know, Garrison also has been misunderstood. Uh, I think that when we get fixated on individuals, you get this narr simple narratives of the white savior and, you know, et cetera. 
But if you look at the movement as an interracial radical movement where whites and blacks were working together, you know, learning from each other, confronting each other, sometimes even fighting with each other and debating each other, I think it's a much more useful um, framework. And it could be that I grew up in India and I'm not just so seeped and in post-independence India, seeped in the, the sort of uh, deep racialisms of the United States that I looked at many of these documents and said, well, this is about something else too. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I think Garrison uh, has been uh, quite misunderstood. Uh, I, you know, I don't look at contemporary uh, takes on Garrison even by uh, scholars who have written now. I always judge these white figures by what contemporary African-Americans are saying about them. Uh, you know, what were African-Americans like William Wells Brown, William Cooper Nell, Maria Stewart, Francis Allen Watkins Harper, uh, Douglas, Frederick Douglass, his famous eulogy for Garrison. What did they say about Garrison? Because they kind of knew him we can just speculate. Um, well, well, thank you. We're, we're gonna pause there. It, it's been a tremendous conversation. I learned a ton. Um, now we want your feedback on this session, um, the, the content and the format. Uh, we've, we've put the link in the chat box to the evaluation, um, but before doing the evaluation, um, please, we're going to ask folks to unmute yourselves and share uh, thank yous to each other um, for your commitment to learning and teaching people's history, to our facilitators, to Manisha. Um, we'll be sending a follow-up email with the resources referenced here today. Um, now, uh, if, if folks go ahead, unmute yourselves. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.